Okay, hello everyone. Today um, we're going to be talking about uh, Pennsylvania State Legislature and our guest speaker today is Joel uh, Oleksik, uh, who is actually one of the, the, the teaching assistant for this class, so he was involved in sort of the grading of your multiple choice exams and, and some other activities as well. And he's a graduate student in the public policy <coughs> program at Drexel. And I asked him in the beginning of the course if he would be willing to give us a lecture about his experiences uh, where he worked in the Pennsylvania State Legislature. So this is directly relevant to the material that's in your book on legislatures, but more specifically, it's about the Pennsylvania State Legislature. So um, Joe will be talking for probably about a half an hour and then he'll take some questions and answers uh, with all of you. Um, you should recognize is that, that Joe started at sort of an entry level, not an intern level, but an entry level and worked in this position for a while, something that some of you might like to do in the future as well. So without any more introduction, Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so like you said, my name is Joe Oleksak. Uh Just a little bit about me. I graduated from Temple in 2014. Uh, I had a master's in public, um, excuse me, a bachelor's in uh, political science, and I had minors in Spanish and economics. Uh, right after I graduated, literally the day after I graduated, I drove out to Paoli, Pennsylvania, and I went to work for State Representative Warren Camp. Uh, I coordinated his election campaign in 2014. When he won re-election in 2014, uh, in November, I worked through the end of the year. I then went to work for State Representative Chris Ross, where I worked in his district office all the way up until his retirement last year. Um, Representative Chris Ross, if anybody has followed state politics in the past couple years, um, he was the chairman of the Liquor Control Committee for the last two years of his 20-year uh, term. Um, and then after he retired, I went to work for Representative Dwayne Milne. I worked for him for about nine months up until about September of this year when I left to come to Drexel to start uh, my, public, my master's in public policy. Um, like I said, I, as Dr. Rosenberg mentioned, you know, I've worked in the state for the better part of two, two and a half years with some other knowledge of campaigns as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, up behind me, if any, has anyone here ever been to Harrisburg? Has anyone ever been up to the Capitol? I'm just curious. Did you see a tour? Um, I, no, I didn't get a chance to like, kind of like, go out. Okay. Yeah, just curious. Uh, I'm biased, but I think Pennsylvania's Capitol building is one of the best looking Capitol buildings in all of the country. Um, so, just a little bit of background about the legislature itself. It is bicameral, uh, meaning it has two houses. It functions very similar to the federal level. You have the lower house, the House of Representatives, which at the state has 203 members and you have an upper chamber called the Senate, and it has 50 members at the state level. That totals out to about 253 legislatures total, which makes it the second largest legislature, excuse me, legislature in this country, second only to New Hampshire, which has something like 400 members of their House of Representatives, but it's a part-time legislature, so Pennsylvania is actually the far largest full-time legislature. And that picture there, just to give you a better picture of how beautiful the building actually is, that's the rotunda right there. And up, if you look up those stairs, the House Chamber is up on the left, on through those doors, and the Senate's up on the right. So just to kind of give some background about the politics in Pennsylvania, uh, right now the governor is Tom Wolf, who is a Democrat. The Senate is controlled by Republicans, 34 seats to 16 D Democrats. Uh, and the House has 121 Republicans to 82 Democrats. So overwhelming Republican control in the legislature, but the governor is, uh, of course, a Democrat. So first, I'm going to talk about the, the Senate a little bit. The Senate, like I said before, has 50 members. Much like the federal level, the Senate has uh, the lieutenant governor instead of the vice president as the president of the Senate. This person breaks the ties. Uh, 34 Republicans, 16 Democrats, doesn't happen too often, but there's, if there's ever a 25-25 vote, the lieutenant governor, much like the vice president, would break that tie. Senators serve four-year terms. Um, what happens is every even year, half of the seats, 25 of them, are up for re-election. So in 2016, half of the Senate was up, and 2018, the other half will be up. And when you kind of divide that those 50 seats up uh, amongst 
the population of Pennsylvania, each of those districts contains about 250,000 people. So some of the characteristics of the Senate that you'll, that if you work around politics uh, in Pennsylvania, you'll start to notice that with the smaller chamber, the members seem to be fairly close. Uh, they're very friendly to one another. They're much more ideologically moderate for that reason. And um, one of the, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about the Senate is while everyone's very moderate, there's also a couple of people on the outliers. You have Dalen Leach on the left and you have uh, Scott Wagner on the right. You may have heard those names. Wagner's running for governor uh, for Republican ticket and uh, Leach, I believe, announced he's gonna run for Congress or at least he's strongly considering running for Congress in uh, Delaware County. But it's an interesting chamber because if you can, kind of, you can kind of see the picture there, uh, the floor is pretty small. Uh, People are kind of sitting right next to each other, and interestingly, they're actually very friendly with one another. Uh, this here is just a map of the, the senatorial districts, just to show you what a quarter million people looks like. Each of those numbers there represents a quarter million people. So you'll see, obviously, some very large districts in the middle, up in the north, but then you look down that bottom right-hand corner and you see much smaller districts, because, of course, it's much more densely populated. Obviously, the red is Republican districts and blue is Democratic. I believe this is from last session, though. Uh, this is a little bit outdated, but um, I think it paints a good picture of Pennsylvania. So next, I want to talk about the leadership of the Senate. Uh, as I said before, the president of the Senate is the lieutenant governor, who is Mike Stack, who is actually from uh, Northeast Philadelphia. Uh, and then you have the president pro tempore, who is Joe Scarnati, representing the majority party. Now, much like the federal level, you have the majority party and the minority party. You have a majority leader, Jake Corman. It's just like, talk, it'd be just like uh, talking about Mitch McConnell. And Jay Costa is the minority leader, much like Chuck Schumer. You'll see a couple other positions here that you'll, if you look at the federal level, you'll see as well. The whip, the caucus chair, perhaps uh, caucus secretary, maybe a little bit more unique to the state level. Uh, Appropriations committee chair, we'll talk about in the next slide. But uh, committee chairs are generally not elected by the caucus. However, appropriations is, because appropriations deals with the budget. So it's actually a really prestigious thing to be. It's, it's, you actually have to basically run within your caucus to be appropriations chair. So it's a pretty big deal to have that role. You also have policy committee chair and the caucus administrator. These roles are more administrative than, um, than anything too influential. So. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about the committees. There are 22 committees in the Senate. Each senator serves on anywhere from five to seven on average, depending on younger reps, usually a few less, because they're not as experienced. Once you start getting to leadership, you also serve on fewer. We kind of run through this, and again, I've pointed out appropriations before, but there's 21 other, dis uh, other committees. A lot of them are very similar to what you'll see in the House, which we'll talk about a little, a little bit. But one thing I want to point out is the the Rules and Executive Nominations Committee. Executive com nominations is actually something unique about the Senate. It's similar to the federal level because the Senate also, at the state level, also has to approve all of the governor's nominations for various posts. So you'll see some pretty generic looking ones there, judiciary, education, finance, transportation. But, um, so next we're gonna talk about the House. The House is a completely different animal. Uh, I'm much more experienced in the House. I've worked for several representatives. I don't know as much about the Senate, but I can tell you that the House of Representatives is, uh, is something quite different. 203 members, 121 Republicans, 82 Democrats. They serve two-year terms, much like congressmen and women. Uh, all 203 seats are up every election. Uh, so they just all got reelected last year. They'll be up for re-election next year. Um, because of the large size, the districts are much smaller, only about 63,000 people, which is a very tiny district, and you'll see in a minute, it's very intimate, a lot more involved at the local level uh, than the Senate. The larger chamber, as you can see, it's pretty cramped. Um, there's 203 people on that same size floor as the Senate. And something that's interesting is if you look on the right-hand side, and also on the left-hand side, it's kind of obscured by the text, you'll see what looks like a scoreboard. That is how they tally votes in the House. There are so many members that you press a button on your table and your name will turn green or red depending on whether you support the bill. Something kind of interesting. Uh, larger chamber means that the members are much more geographically affiliated. 
So when you look at the House floor, they actually sit with their county delegations. So all the Chester County Republicans sit together, all the Philadelphia Democrats sit together on the other side. Um, it tends to, be, it's kind of clicky like that. You tend to stick with the people that you are familiar with, your neighboring districts. A lot of the districts kind of overlap, school districts, things like that. And so there's sort of an affiliation with where you're from. You're not a Pennsylvania state rep, you are part of the Montgomery County delegation, the Erie County delegation, name your de county, that's who you affiliate with. So, and you'll see on the next slide why that is. What ends up happening is you have a much more ideologically diverse group of people. You have some Republicans that are very far right, you have some Republicans that are borderline Democrats, you have Democrats who are borderline Republicans, and you have some very progressive left members of the Democratic caucus as well. Um, because the caucuses are so big, there is some infighting. Um, you know, moderate Democrats, uh, moderate Republicans rather, uh, especially in this part of the state, Chester County, do not really get along with some of the more conservative members from the western and northern parts of the state. But so that's just something that's kind of unique is that there's a there's a lot going on, and as you can see, that's why uh, there are a lot of districts, and uh, there's some very large districts up at the north. And you'll see some very tiny little districts down at the bottom right hand corner. Each of those equals 63,000 people. So you can see where there's some issues, some of the logistics of running some of the districts up in the north versus the south. And I'm going to show you here this next slide is Philadelphia's growth districts. Uh, you can see the 182nd there in the middle, that's uh, Brian Sims district. You can kind of see it's not more than about 10 blocks wide. Uh, at, at its narrowest part, I think it's only about a block wide. So I, I think it's kind of interesting because that's each of those is also 62,000 people. House leadership, much like the Senate, much like the US Congress, you have a Speaker of the House, who in this case is Mike Terzai, has all the same powers, largely the, it's largely the same thing as Paul Ryan. You have the, floor, the majority leader, the minority leader, Dave Reed, Frank Derby respectively, same thing as uh, Kevin McCarthy and, and uh, Nancy Pelosi. And again, you have a whip, you have caucus chair, caucus secretary. Again, the appropriations chair is an elected uh, leadership position. You have caucus administrator, policy committee chair. And then we're going to talk about now the committees in the House. There are 27 committees in the House. Some of these, just some of them are a little bit different. Uh, they kind of some of the district, uh, some of the committees kind of broken half. But once more, you'll see that the appropriations chair is again uh, highlighted there. Um, just kind of some background on that. So there is sort of prestige to leadership. Uh, members who are moving up into the committee's chair, they've been around for a couple of years, um, they start to bring them in. You get assigned as a chairman to some of the lesser, uh, lesser committees is what they're kind of referred to as, but you'll have a committee like, you know, say, Veterans Affairs and Emergency Preparedness. They don't meet on such a, those hot button issues that they, you do with the budget. So appropriations is probably one of the biggest deals uh, education uh, is also usually pretty big. Um, judiciary also fairly big, but you can kind of see that there is uh, there's a wide variety of topics up there. And uh, representatives usually serve on three to five, and this kind of creates a sort of uh, disparity between the issues of uh, that they that they know about. Lawyers tend to be on the judiciary committee, but sometimes you find one of them on the agricultural committee. You have a couple of farmers in the state. We'll talk about that on the next slide. But then you'll also have them serving on the education. It can create some issues. Um, so I, I think that's all I have on that slide. This I thought was interesting. Dr. Rosenberg specifically asked me to talk a little bit about the demographics of the House and the Senate. The average age of the House of Representatives and PA is 53, and the Senate's 58. Uh, education level, only 4% have less than bachelors, which I, I thought was uh, kind of low. Uh, bachelors and postgraduate make up a bulk of, of the members, and there is some no data miss. There's some data missing there. Just the the source did not have the biographies of all the representatives. 18% female uh, makeup of the legislature. 82% are males, and Pennsylvania just for comparative purposes, 51% female overall population. 49% male, and if you look at all the state legislatures. Uh, it, Generally, they're about 24% female, 76% male, so PA is actually a little behind that. This I thought was really interesting that I found was the generation breakdown. 
7% uh, millennial, I thought was pretty impressive as a millennial myself. Uh, Gen X uh, is rather large, but 57% are considered baby boomers. So, um, I mean, things are obviously, it's changing uh, over the years, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Occupation, um, about 30% of the entire legislature is made up of attorneys and business, and business professionals is what they refer to it as. But then also, I thought was interesting is you have 48% register or consider themselves legislatures, legislators as their career. So take that for what it is. Race and ethnicity, uh, it's 91% white, 8% black, and 1% Hispanic. Um, not very representative of the uh, of minorities, but that's changing a little bit. So next, I want to talk about the legislative sessions, just a little bit how they work while they're up in Harrisburg. Article 2 of the uh, Pennsylvania Constitution says that they will convene the first Tuesday of January every year. So what ends up happening is every two years, you start a new session. So right now, we're in the 2017-18 session. At the end of every session, at the end of in the November after an election, what happens is any piece of legislation that has been introduced that has not been passed it is just white. There, it no longer exists. Everything has to start over new the next January. And so what ends up happening is when, I don't, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the legislative process in this regards, so when the new session starts, all of a sudden you start over with House Bill 1, House Senate Bill 1, and you work your way up. Um, so when the sessions are convened, both chambers are generally in session Monday through Wednesday of the week. Then they usually go back to the districts on uh, uh, two, Thursday and Friday. There's no set amount of time that they spend up there, but I would say they're up there probably two-thirds of the year, two-thirds of the weeks out of the year. And that's averaging in, especially with budget time, May and June. They, they basically spend 30 days in June up in, uh, up in Harrisburg when they're working on the budget. We'll talk about the budget process on the next slide. but. Uh, you know, work in Harrisburg consists of committee meetings, uh, meetings with various advocacy groups, Temple University, uh, Penn State University, Pitt and Lincoln University often send students up to discuss funding for their universities, things like that. Uh, they also meet in caucus, which means the House Republicans, the House Dems, the Senate Republicans and the Senate Dems, they get together before they go onto the House floor or the Senate floor to discuss voting priorities, what they think about it, what they, uh, what. What are your concerns? Are you gonna vote for it? Are you gonna vote for it? This is what I think, that sort of thing. And then of course they spend time on the floor itself, which is uh, when they're actually in session. Um, we're gonna talk about the budget now. So the budget is, if anyone familiar with the budget process in Pennsylvania, anybody read anything about it? If you read anything about it, you know that it's a very slow moving process. Uh, it tends to take a very long time to hash things out. The budget, the fiscal year runs July 1st through June 30th. The past couple years, we have not had a budget in by June 30th. And actually, we just finalized the budget two or three weeks ago. So pretty late. Um, this is just kind of a quick rundown of the process. You know, you start out with each agency kind of getting together and submitting what they want to the governor, saying this is my wish list. So the transportation says, I want this much more money. Can I get this much more money? So the governor puts it together and then uh, by February, the governor gives what is essentially the equivalent of the State of the Union. They refer to it as the budget address. He goes up there and he says, all right, this is what I want in the budget. And then the House and the Senate get together, a joint session of the legislature, they meet. And then the next couple weeks, they start hearing, having public hearings. Uh, everyone can come up and testify why this department deserves more, why this doesn't. And then in May and June, they get together and actually put out a budget. And the budget is an interesting process in PA. Uh, the governor, uh, like 43 other states, has line item veto power, meaning that they can veto just sections of the bill rather than the whole bill. The president obviously does not have that ability. Uh, to pass a budget, you just need a simple majority, 50% plus one, so uh, 102 members in the House, 26 in the Senate. And what's actually really interesting is the, the legislature is not required to submit a balanced budget to the governor. They can basically give the governor whatever they put together, but it's up to the governor to submit a balanced budget. It, the governor is the only one actually required to do so. So the governor is it's up to him to then ultimately veto out the things that he doesn't want. Then it has to go back to the House, and that's why it tends to take several months to actually get done. It's a very frustrating process as an employee because a lot of money gets 
held up and um, and uh, people, be, constituents become very frustrated with this. Uh, the other thing that's kind of unique, and unique thing with the legislature, and this happens in all states for the most part, any, uh, though that's changing, is redistricting. Redistricting, um, I don't know how many of you, are, how many of you are familiar with the redistricting process? Have Blair talked a little bit about it. So in Pennsylvania, uh, like every state, it happens every 10 years after the census. Uh, congressional redistricting is something that is done by the General Assembly itself. The General Assembly gets together, passes a bill, draws up the lines, how they want it for the congressional seats. But the state house and the state senate seats are actually apportioned slightly differently. Uh, so what happens is there's a five-member commission. The Senate Majority Leader, the Senate Minority Leader, this House Majority Leader, and the House Minority Leader all get to, to nominate one person to serve on the commission. And there's a fifth member of that commission, and that fifth member of the commission is designated by the other four members of the, uh, of the commission, and the four of them have to come together and agree on a chair, and that chair is that fifth member. If they can't agree to anybody on anybody, then the Supreme Court appoints someone. And then this is how they draw up the House seats and the Democrat, I mean, uh, the Senate seats, the maps that I showed you previously. Um, and I, I put this quote in here because I, I thought it was important to note. Uh, P PA Constitution requires that state legislative districts be contigu contiguous, compact, and must, quote, respect county, city, incorporated town, borough, township, and ward boundaries, meaning they can't just take us a small town and cut it in half and give half, the, half it to one district and half to another. Obviously in Philadelphia, it happens. That has to happen. That's why they have to have ward boundaries. But that's only for state districts. That is actually not, the PA Constitution does not require the same thing for uh, congressional districts. They abide by different rules for that. And so this is, this is obviously a map of the Pennsylvania congressional districts. There's 18, and you can see what happens. Uh, some of these districts are, are very long. Some aren't too bad, um, but if you look down at the 7th district in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see it kind of go up into Montgomery County, it sort of juts around a little bit down in Delaware County, and in Chester County where I worked, uh, this district is now uh, uh, Congressman Meehan. Uh, there's actually a point where there's just one township wide through the center part of Chester County, and it was very frustrating because our district was three different congressional districts, and only one or two of the townships were actually uh, in that congressional district. And it goes up. You can see that they're not in any way contiguous. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate over uh, over redistricting. This is not the time or place, but I just thought I'd kind of point that out to you guys just to show you how that works. I'm going to give a quick rundown on how a bill becomes a law. I mean, if you guys have seen Schoolhouse Rock, um, I'm just a bill. It's largely the same. Um, and it's a little bit different. There's some there's some tech, uh, there's some language that they use. So first, the bill is introduced. It's assigned a bill number. Uh, if it's uh, introduced by a rep uh, representative, it goes. It becomes a house bill. If it's represented, if it's uh, introduced by a senator, it becomes a senate bill. Then it, the speaker in the house, or the president, tempore or pro tempore, or the president of the senate, will assign it to a committee in that chamber. That's considered first consideration. So in the committee, you sit down, you hold a, a public hearing, uh, you talk about it, uh, members of the committee can introduce amendments, you can change it, and then at the end of it, you vote. They have basically three options. You can either vote on the bill as is and pass it, you can amend the bill and pass the amended version, or you can choose not to report the bill. When a bill is not reported, it's said to die in committee. The bill is never taken to the House floor, it's never taken to the Senate floor, it's never dealt with again. It, it's just, it's not talked about. Then it goes to the first chamber. So House bills go to the House, Senate bills go to the Senate. Um, you'll see second consideration there is where it's brought onto the House floor and it's at this point where all the rest of that chamber can now introduce amendments. After all the amendments are debated through and that is a lengthy process, let me tell you. Um, it's actually, Pennsylvania is kind of interesting. There are times where they will actually put forth an amendment, pass an amendment, and then pass the second amendment, removing the per first amendment. Really weird, but it happens more times than you think. Uh, sometimes there can be 120 amendments to a single bill. That only happens with really big bills like liquor privatization a couple years ago. After an amendment bill is put together, uh, it goes to third consideration, where it's finally debated as a whole and voted. And once if it passes, it goes to the Senate, goes through the same process again, 
if anything's amended differently, it then has to go back to the House for concurrence. If they can't agree to concur on a bill, then you go to a conference and you hash out your differences and you try to get the bill together. Once it's finally passed by both chambers, it goes to the governor. The governor may sign it, the governor may veto it, he may also line item veto it, and it takes two thirds of the majority to overturn any vetoes, much like at the federal level. Um, just a couple other things there. If the governor takes no action at all, it actually becomes a bill automatically after 10 days. Uh, if the House and the Senate are in session, if they're not, it takes 30 days. Once it becomes law, it, it's signed into law, it, it's designated an act. So sometimes you'll see something like Act 180 of 2010. What it means is the 180th law signed in, in 2010. But that's not that. So we're going to talk about the caucus structure a little bit. Like I said before, there's four caucuses. House Dems, House Republicans, Senate Dems, Senate Republicans. Uh, each caucus has its own structure. I work for the House Republicans. I don't know anything about any of the other caucuses. Uh, I know little bits about it, but uh, only enough to know that they function a lot differently. And each caucus is responsible for pretty much everything on their own, from salaries, staffing, uh, human resources. They have their own legal departments. They have their own mailing. Uh, the, the House GOP refers to it as the print shop. Anything you want printed up, postcards, brochures, they print it for you. Uh, each, each rep is allocated a certain budget for that. And then they also have their own communications department. So I'm just gonna kind of talk about how the House GOP works. It's similar enough in structure that it, I think it, it should translate pretty well, but this is my personal experience. So first and foremost, you have your Harrisburg office. Uh, each representative generally has only one staffer up there. They're referred to as a legislative assistant. There also are individuals known as twofers. What they are are legislative assistants that serve two reps. So actually two reps will share one uh, LA. And uh, this usually happens with freshmen. When you're a freshman, you tend to get smaller offices that share a, a little lobby. And so you tend to just have room for only one secretary. Uh, once you move up, I don't know if, you, if, you, if anyone has ever learned about this, uh, at the federal level they do this, and so they do a similar thing at the, the state level. Every year when a bunch of representatives or senators retire, uh, there's a hierarchy. So based on your seniority, you get to bump up to a new office, and it kind of just goes down the list until all the offices are occupied. Uh, when I worked for Chris Ross, who had been there for 20 years, he had this amazing office in Bryan office building, crown molding, you know, 20 foot ceilings, huge windows, private bathroom. And then uh, I went to go visit Representative Camp's office, and it was basically in the basement, tiny little window, no bigger than a dorm bedroom. Um, just I thought it was kind of interesting. In uh, the office work in the HO consists of scheduling appointments in Harrisburg when the rep is up there. They have to schedule every meeting that they have, uh, whether it's with lobbyists, whether it's with advocacy groups, whether it's with other reps, leadership, things like that. Um, they do some legislative work, particularly when it's dealing with other agencies. Uh, they deal with any casework that's dealing with other Harrisburg offices. So when, uh, for instance, we're dealing with a PennDOT issue and somebody's trying to get a handicap placard, it's usually the Harrisburg office that then facilitates the work between the Harrisburg office and PennDOT itself. Uh, then you also have support staff. Support staff is social media. You have caucus communications, which is social media, website. All of that is handled. One guy is assigned to sometimes six to 10 representatives, and they run their Facebook page, their website. Uh, they'll order the printing for you. They'll do press releases, all of that sort of stuff. So that's actually done out of Harrisburg. Uh, district operations, they come and set up your offices. They move your offices. When a rep is elected, they find you an office. When you retire, they break the lease for you. You have an IT department, which is critical for all the computers that are state run. Um, you have research staff. Anytime that I, working in the district office, would have uh, somebody call in and say, hey, what's going on with this piece of legislation? I would call research staff and they put together a whole memo for us and tell us exactly what's going on, what the thoughts are. They'd even draft letters for us if, if we wanted it. I, we generally didn't do that, but it was an option. Um, Research staff is assigned to specific committees, so one person is assigned to the appropriations committee. So any budget guy, any budget issues, I call up one specific person. Anytime there's an issue with PennDOT, I have one specific person to call. Uh, you also have human resources, of course, and a legal department. A uh, legal department does everything from working on the bills itself to dealing with workplace complaints, which 
as we hear at the federal level is something that's pretty rampant these days, but the state level, luckily, knock on wood, has not really been a big problem. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about the district office staff. Colloquially, we refer to it as the DO. Uh, this is where I worked. I was a constituent uh, service worker. I, when you call your state rep, okay. you need to close the window to okay. cancel. And go up to the red button. There we go. It's weird. It doesn't show. It wasn't on this screen. Um, so anytime you call your state rep. If you ever called where I worked, it was probably me that answered the phone. Uh, each representative is allowed generally one district office. Uh, some of those districts, if you think back to that map, are very large. They sometimes have two, some have three. Just because some of those districts, it will take an hour and a half to get from one side to the other. But especially in this area, you can walk in 15 minutes from one end of the district to the other. Um, so, like I said, um, let's see here. And then some offices do mobile offices. So when I worked for Representative Nill, uh, I think it was every Tuesday we went to a different library and you just sat there, anyone that came in, we had brochures, things like that, took down their information, and we'd call them back from the district office a little bit later. Uh, some districts, they go to town, you know, municipal buildings, sometimes at the firehouse, um, but it, it kind of allows you to decentralize a little bit and go out to some of the other parts of the district that are less populated. And it's interesting because actually watching uh, Representative Ross retire and watch the new rep trying to find office space, it can be very difficult to find office space because you are on a budget. Uh, something that people don't actually really think about is that they actually are pretty uh, in tune with how much money they spend. Uh, they're only allowed up to about $2,000 a month of rent for an office space, which might sound like a lot at first, but that buys you a very small, tiny office, so just something to keep in mind. I, um, so staff size differs from office to office. Some reps like big staff, some like smaller staffs. Every staff has a office manager, otherwise known as a chief of staff. They're not actually called the chief of staff, we just refer to them as that. They're called district office managers. Um, usually then there's one, at least one or two full-time constituent outreach specialists, that was me. Um, if you have two or three of those, you don't get part-time. If you only have one or two of those, you can have a part-time eight or two. So uh, I worked in one office when I worked for Representative Ross. There was only two of us. Uh, when I worked for Representative Milne, there were four of us. I know one district, Representative Camp's office actually has five. Uh, but he only has two full-time and three part-time. Of course, then you have interns and things like that. But offices are generally pretty small staffed. Um, and each rep's office is is pretty much as unique as the rep's personality. Uh, having gone from a couple different offices, I can tell you that they're not at all alike. Even if the districts are five minutes apart from one another, you'll go walk into one office and the culture is completely different. Some are much more friendly, some are much more kind of focused on work. Uh, sometimes the reps are always there, sometimes they're not really there. Um, it differs, and it actually is kind of crazy sometimes when you go from one office to another and you're trying to get work done from another office, and you find out that they're not on the same page as you at all. So just some of the stuff that the district office does, constituent issues is the majority of the work. You call in, you need a, you need a uh, birth certificate. We handle that. Handicap records, we handle that. Having any issue with PennDOT whatsoever will help facilitate it. You need help uh, filling out paperwork for um, CHIP for children, we'll help you with that. Um, I mean, the list can go on and on. Any state department, we'll deal with. Um, we deal with correspondence. Anytime somebody emails or writes a letter, we'll draft something up for the representative, and we'll send that out. Uh, schedule meetings and events in the district for the representative, so anytime, say, the school district wants to have the rep come speak, we will set it up. Um, you want to have him or her go talk to uh, Boy Scout Troop, Girl Scout Troop, we'll set that up. Uh, we'll host events, mobile office as I discussed before. Uh, Representative Milne in particular has a massive kids fest. Is anyone here from Chester County area, Delaware County, anyone from Mainline? Are you familiar with the event at all? Where are you from? I'm in Chester Springs, Alexander. Okay, that's a bit further south. Are you? Representative Milne has this event, Kids Fest, every year 10,000 people show up. 
is insane. Everything is funded not by the state, it's entirely funded by uh, donors. People come in, and not donor, political donors, but uh, rather they'll, we'll go to Pepsi and ask Pepsi to donate $500 worth of drinks. And we'll go to Coke and ask them to donate $500 worth of drinks. And we'll go to Wawa and we'll go to Utz Chips and they'll donate chips. And it's, a, it's insane what they put together. And it's taken 10 years. I was only there for the la most recent one. Um, there's a dunk tank, there's bouncy castles. Everyone walks, and it's really great because all the kids have fun, and it allows the representative to kind of get to meet his constituents or constituents and talk with them and, and see them one on one. That's actually Representative Milne in the dunk tank right there. Um, outreach to municipalities, school districts, universities, fire and police. So what you have is when you have these towns, there's several different fire departments, several different school districts, several municipalities. The representative needs to balance all of that. So sometimes a, a school district might fall into two or three districts, uh, representatives' districts. You gotta work with the other reps when there's an issue and the school district calls. The school district is calling two or three different representatives. Um, universities, you deal a lot with their funding. You hear a lot from the universities, things like that. So I, I'm sure if any, if any of you are concerned about funding here, um, grant other grants and things like that, although being a private university is probably a little bit different. Um, you know, you would call your representative here. Um, and then work with other adjacent representative offices, so like that, if a school district, Philadelphia school district, there's 25 some different reps all dealing with the Philadelphia school district. Uh, life in office, so representatives tend to have a lot going on in their lives. Uh, they do not supersede local officials at all, so they have to deal with working with township supervisors and mayors and things like that, um, they can't sit there and tell a mayor not to do something. They can't sit there and tell a township not to build a road. They, they don't have the power to do that. A lot of constituents call in thinking that, but they can be influential. They can go in and, and tell them, you know, here's what I think. I think you shouldn't do this, that sort of stuff. But um, some people think that this, the local government answers to the state. They do not. Uh, local officials, citizens, businesses often ask their legislators to help push priorities. So when they want grant money to build a new road, to build a new school, um, we were just dealing with, I wrote a grant letter for, I guess a grant support letter for uh, historical sugar town in Chester County. They're trying to uh, build, uh, essentially rebuild a, a house from the 1700s that has had a lot of structural damage over the years. We'll help with that. Um, various endorsement letters, letters of recommendation, um, Eagle Scout citations, all that good stuff. Retirement citations, we'll put those together. You, it comes in a real nice folder, it looks kind of like this. And uh, I don't know if anyone here, I, I mean I was an Eagle Scout myself, I received one when I received my Eagle Scout, I don't know if anyone here is in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts and received one. Pretty cool thing that they do, right? I mean it's, um, so they'll order those and, and they sign them and everything, it, it's a really cool thing. Um, work outside the office. They are allowed to have other jobs. Uh, a lot of job, a lot of the representatives that were lawyers still remain lawyers. They may not work full time, but they are kept on as staff so that they do a little bit of legal work so that they keep their license. Uh, Representative Milne, in particular, he is a professor at Westchester University. Uh, that's a fairly common thing. Um, Representative Verb, who's now retired, was an engineer. Uh, Representative Milne and several others are in the military. Representative McCarelli in Delaware County. They're in the Army Reserves. Um, and some are doctors. I don't know if they still practice, but I do know some of them are medical doctors. Um, so I'm just, next, I'm just gonna wrap up and kind of talk about interactions with other groups. The House of Representatives definitely deals a lot with the executive branch, um, we court, but we in the district office don't do quite as much. So the Harrisburg office, will, if the governor wants to meet, the Harrisburg office coordinates that or any department secretary wants to meet with the representative, they'll coordinate that. Uh, caucus Communications oversees any prep for, uh, press conferences and releases, so after the budget address, the House Republicans, the House Dems, all get up in front of the screen and give their take on it, why they, this is good, why this is bad. And the DO is usually notified when the governor, the lieutenant governor, or another secretary is coming into the district uh, to, uh, to have an event. We're usually told of any town halls, so they'll say, hey, if the representative wants to attend, but usually you get about five hours notice, they're real nice about it. Uh, interactions with the judicial branch. 
There's really not a lot of interaction, Supreme Court, Superior Court, Commonwealth Court, they're usually fairly independent. Um, oftentimes, constituents will call in and want help with district courts, uh, legal matters, they're having an issue, somebody's suing them, they're trying to sue somebody. Once it's a legal matter, an elected official cannot, or at least will not help you. You need to get a lawyer, end of, end of story there. But I just want to bring that up to let people know. If you ever have a legal issue, your elected officials are not the people to call about it. And uh, other interactions, you deal with other agencies. So PennDOT, as I mentioned before, PennDOT is a bulk of what we did. Uh, a lot of people have issues with PennDOT, whether it's your license, uh, Real ID, if anyone is familiar with the Real ID issue right now in Pennsylvania, that's a big one. Um, road repairs, of course, the bane of every district office staff's assist, a staffer's uh, existence. Uh, Department of Health is pretty big, Department of Aging, Department of Labor, unemployment is, is another big issue that comes around, especially in, uh, in January, February. Uh, companies, Verizon, Pico, Blue Cross, uh, County Assistance Office, they have government affairs departments, so when we have somebody that's having an issue with one of those departments, we call them up and say, hey, what's going on? And then federal and local government, all issues dealing with federal and local agencies are forwarded to congressional offices, municipal officials. We don't get involved in federal issues. We don't get involved in local issues. Local issue, local officials don't get involved in state issues. Federal, same, same story. Uh, we don't step on toes. And I, I think that's uh, largely all that I have. Um, I know I kind of rushed through the end there. Just there wasn't a whole lot there. I don't know if anyone has any questions, thoughts. Any yeah. questions from people in the room? Is it? Um isn't Verizon like private company? It is. So how do you, what's the interaction between them? So we don't have any, no, Verizon and the state are completely separate. But what happens is say, you're, say you're having an issue with cable. Uh, your, your, your phone lines are down. And so you're con trying to contact somebody, trying to get a hold, and you're waiting on Verizon to call you back. And it can take days sometimes. Uh, what we can kind of do is put a sort of inside line in and we'll call our liaison and say, hey, what's going on? They'll check on it and they'll find, uh, oh, well, a tree fell. We'll, we'll send you, we're sending a crew out, that sort of thing. So it, it's not so much there. We don't have any power over Verizon necessarily or Pico for that matter or any utilities, but we do have an inside line with SEPTA and all of those organizations because when there is an issue, constituents call us asking questions and they want to get the news out as well quickly as possible, so there's sort of a two-way street. We help them help themselves. That makes sense. Other questions? One of the things, Joe, Joe, that you mentioned was the amount of time that they work, and I don't know that it's real clear, but you said that, um, uh, that on average uh, a senator or rep spends about two-thirds of the year in Harrisburg. I said two-thirds of the week. Of the weeks, okay, yeah, of the year. and then they, when they're there, they're working supposedly full time. the 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 point, though, that I wanted you to address, if you could, is that that's Monday through Wednesday, Generally, yes. okay. And my thought is is that those reps and senators actually spend a lot of time related to their positions outside of that Monday to Wednesday, right. going to public meetings, working with lobbyists, doing all this. Could you speak to that just a little bit in terms of what a week might actually be in terms of hours for these people? Uh, you know, it's really hard to quantify that. Uh, every week is different. There are some weeks that, for instance, when I work for Representative uh, Ross, he would, most reps, what they'll do, is they'll, they'll drive up Sunday night and then stay and they'll drive back Wednesday night. Uh, Representative Ross drove up every day about an hour from where, where he worked. So he'd drive up to Harrisburg Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, he'd be in the district office pretty much nine to five for the most part, unless he had a meeting. Uh, Friday, he'd be there most of the day, most for the most part. Um, evenings are generally where you'll meet with Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout troops, um, go to township meetings. Weekends are where you have parades and all those sort of things. So some weeks, it, it, I mean, it probably is, I add up to 80, 90 hours a week. Some weeks are much less. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard because, they, especially in budget time, they're up there seven days a week working 
hopefully full time. But uh, yeah, it, every week is a little bit different. It depends on what their tasks are. And do you have uh, a sense of what the salaries are for these people, roughly? It's, uh, it's just over eighty-five thousand for, for both senators and reps. And a senator. Okay. Which is, I believe, the highest in the country. It might be second highest. I know California is up there too. Mm -hmm. They also have a two hundred dollar a day per diem for food, things like that, while they're in session. Only while they're in session. They can be reimbursed for mileage on their car, gasoline, things like that. Um, hotel, they can get reimbursements for all of that stuff. Okay. And that also applies to staff too. When we travel to Harrisburg, we also can receive a per diem. Okay, one of the things that is a little bit beyond Joe, Joe's talk is number one, there happens to be a culture that sort of happens with a lot of these reps and senators when they go to Harrisburg, uh, they're away from their wives and their children and their families and they end up eating together, socializing together. So there's kind of the in capital sort yes. of life and the out of capital life, yes. which is something that takes place. It, it can rival a frat house from what I've understood. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, when they're in Harrisburg, they're with each other, and they're all away from home. Um, that's why, you know, Representative Ross, he, he would commute every day, probably to avoid that. Um, I think after a while, I'm sure they get sick of it, but it, it can get, I've heard the rumors, I'm not going to dispel any of them, but I have heard some rumors, and it can be a little bit crazy up there. Okay. You had a question. Uh, yeah, so... In my opinion, I feel like people are more focused on federal law, federal laws and legislation right. rather than state ones. Yes. So, it was, were there any like bills passed that you thought was major, but you got less reaction from public than you anticipated? I think the budget every year tends to be underreported a little bit, and there are some people who follow the state budget nonstop, and they're really passionate about. It. But I think a lot of people overlook some of the implications that are in the budget. Uh, funding for schools, for roads, uh, a couple hundred million dollars here or there doesn't sound like a whole lot when you're talking $33 billion, but it adds up pretty fast. And there was a whole issue where uh, when the budget standoff went several months over two years ago, um, funding was essentially cut off for burn centers. So. Anyone that was in an accident and had third degree burns, uh, they were at risk of not having money left over. A lot of hospitals were relying on certain money for transport and things like that. Fire departments um, were going to stop receiving funding because it just there was no new revenue coming in. So I think it gets overlooked um, some of the implications the state has. And like you said, people pay attention to the state, federal government, because we think that the federal government is everything we do. But you'd be surprised if you actually looked into what the state is capable of doing, especially in Pennsylvania that has a very uh, strong legislature compared to some other states. There can be some really drastic uh, uh, implications, problems that occur when certain things happen. So uh, budget is probably the big one, especially education funding. Um, but you know, there's probably some other ones. Liquor privatization is sort of my, my little pet project. I'm working for Representative Ross, and that's actually what I'm doing my thesis on uh, for uh, my master's program. Um, I think that's something that's also overlooked in the state, but definitely, there's a lot of things that I think if you actually looked into the state, you'd be surprised what you'd find out. Just as a conclusion, if you would, would you share with uh, the students the process if someone wanted to go work? in the legislative process, either uh, for a rep, a senator, or for the bodies themselves? I mean, how would one likely proceed? Right. Um, I would say that there's no real one path. Um, it is about who you know. So offices are, are small staff. So you need to have, if you want to work in a district office, for instance, um, you really need to have eyes and ears in that office, if there's one office you particularly want to work in, uh, to know when somebody's leaving. Staff tends to roll over for quite a bit. Our salaries are not high at all. Um, so there tends to be a lot of rollover. 
a lot of people want to leave, they go do what I did, go back to school, some take higher, better jobs, some go to other offices because they get a promotion in the other office, they'll go to another rep's office because they want to make them chief of staff. Um, knowing the rep means a lot, or knowing another rep in a word for you means a lot. If you want to work in Harrisburg, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit more of a meritocracy there in the sense of you submitting a resume. If you want to work in research, uh, you would. there's a department of research. And if you want to work for the House Republicans, House Dems, whatever, you would send it to the caucus research department, or your resume, uh, cover letter, anything like that, and they would look at you. If you want a job just in the capital itself, you want to be one of the legislative assistants up there, that, again, you would submit a resume to probably HR, kind of just say, you know, are there any openings? A lot of that is pretty readily available. They'll tell you if there are openings and what they're looking for people. Um, it's a little bit more, like I said, a little bit more streamlined in that way, a little bit more meritocracy. Um, but in the district offices, it's uh, usually by the time an opening is opening, or something's opening, uh, somebody's usually lined up, they have a couple resumes narrowed down. Um, when I worked for Representative Ross, there was a good stack of resumes sitting in a file when we were going through all the paperwork. So people do submit re uh, resumes pretty regularly, but I, I would definitely say it's a lot about how who you know and who you've worked for in the past to give you, to let your resume stand out above everyone else's, so it kind of moves up to the top of the list. So. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much and for coming in and answering our questions. Thank you.